So I think we'll get started. So um, just a little reminder that you can, if you've just joined us, please do use that Q&A box at the bottom to submit your questions as we go and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. Uh, but for now, let me hand over to uh, Baron van Hemmerden, our coordinator of our Global Flyways program here at BirdLife International. Hello, everyone. It's great to, uh, to have you on this webinar. Uh, my name is Baron van Hemmerden. I'm the coordinator of BirdLife Global Flyways program. And I'm really happy to present to you today because I can talk about two of my favorite things. Those are coastal wetlands and migratory birds. So um, I'm from the Netherlands, which is, as you probably know, a very low-lying country with a lot of water. And we also have one of the best, biggest, most beautiful wetlands in the world, which is the Wadden Sea. And it's not just in the Netherlands. It goes from the Netherlands to Germany to Denmark. Um, and that's an amazing site. I grew up in the north of the Netherlands and in my teens. I, um, I will share you a picture of me in my teens. Um, I took my bike, rode the odd 50 kilometers from my parents' house to see the Wadden Sea. And every time we saw amazing birds, but most uh, like these episodes. But most importantly, this, this site was, as for the Netherlands standards, it was as pristine as it could be. So it was a great site. It was large. It had incredible uh, intertidal mud floods, huge flocks of birds. And every time you would visit it, it would be different. The tides, the seasons, just an amazing place. So um, just to bear in mind that this amazing place, only in the up to the early 70s, there were still plans to, to reclaim the land, to build dikes, to make it agricultural land. Luckily, the conservationists at the time were alert, and they stopped that daft plan from being executed. But even when I was um, starting my birding career in the, in the Wadden Sea, there was things were not all that rosy. So for instance, we had industrial shell fisheries going on that sort of ruined the sediment layers. We didn't have any old mussel banks left, which is sort of our equivalent of uh, coral reefs. And um, so it was not all good, but hard work has been put into it by many organizations, including the BirdLife Partner in the Netherlands. And now the Wadden Sea is declared a World Heritage Site. So all the way from the Netherlands up to Denmark, it's a vast area that's been managed with the primary target of maintaining its value for biodiversity, and especially for the 12 million migratory birds that depend on it. So that's a huge feat. And it's something that I'm really happy with. And many people go visit the site and admire it just like me. So, uh, so that's a great thing. So these um, coastal wetlands, they are havens for migratory birds and especially the intertidal mudflats. Those are the mudflats that, you know, they show up when the tides are low and disappear when the tides are high. And the soft sediments just has an enormous amount of food for migratory birds. So, the different styles of migratory birds, some of them just prod the, the sediment and try to find worms and, and crabs and shellfish. And, and, and as, as James will probably ex explain also, uh, something that's called biofilm. And, um, and, and, you and different birds have different adaptations. So there's the Asian curlew that has a long bill, was go prod deeply into the soil and others have shorter bills or strangely shaped bills like the school bill sandpiper um, and they have different uh, prey they feed on. Um, so with the tide, so when it's low tide, so that's the picture on the left, um, the birds will disperse and, and be feeding on the, on the intertidal mudflats. But when it gets high tide, um, they can't feed which is sort of their favorite thing to do when they're in these areas. And they, they congregate at high tide roosts. So these are uh, golden plovers and they, they just wait out till, um, till it's time again to feed. Of course, these high tide roosts are, 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 that's where the birds need to rest and save energy. And it's also, oh, sorry, that's, those are also the areas where you could um, easily disturb them. So like dogs, people's walking, um, kite serving, et cetera. So those are, that is especially the time the birds are very vulnerable for, um, for disturbance. So for a migratory bird, um, especially the waders, they tend to hop from coastal wetlands to coastal wetlands along their biannual journey. So here you see the migration route of the uh, 
red knot subspecies uh, Rufa. Uh, this is the, the spring migration, so it's from the, the tip of uh, South America. It goes in several hops to the breeding grounds in Canada. And the timing of this migration is crucial. They need to arrive in a specific site in time to benefit from the abundance of a specific uh, food source at that time. So the picture shows that the Rufa red knot uh, in the Delaware Bay, uh, and here is the, they, they time their arrival exactly to be aligned with the, uh, the spawning of the horseshoe crabs. So the eggs of the horseshoe crabs become like the, the staple food for the migratory shorebirds there. Unfortunately, there's also a heavy fishing going on for the horseshoe crab. So at the moment, there are not enough horseshoe crab eggs for the birds to, uh, to eat on. And as a result, the condition uh, when they arrive at breeding grounds is suboptimal. And that led to a, a serious drop in the population of the red knot. Okay, people also love coastal wetlands since, since ancient times, people have uh, built their settlements around coastal wetlands just because there's so much food around. Um, other benefits are um, that the, the, the coastal wetlands provide like uh, for people, they, they are included in their economies, they are part of their culture, they, in, uh, they, they protect against uh, floods. Uh, and in these current times, it's also important to recognize they're also a huge sink for carbon. So they're good to, to, to absorb carbon by climate change. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of threats to, uh, to coastal wetlands and as a consequence to migratory birds. So one sixth of all mud floods globally have disappeared in the last uh, 30 years. And, and in some regions that's even worse. So for instance, two thirds of the intertidal mud floods in the, um, in the Yellow Sea region have disappeared since the 1950s and even worse, about 40% of the intertidal mud floods in China have disappeared since the 1980s. So that's horrible and that has direct consequences. So making that the East Asian Oscillation Flyway currently one of the most threatened flyway. So what are these threats? So the big problem essentially is land claim for development. So these mud floods are often seen as useless and a great place to build harbors, to airport extensions, industrial estates, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, um, so that's a, that's the big one. So in the in the top right corner, you see a picture of the, the sea wall that's built in South Korea, and that's sort of uh, diked in uh, 400 square kilometers of uh, intertidal mud flat. So the red knot, the poor thing in the bottom picture, uh, came back on its migration the next year after it had been uh, reclaimed. Uh, and, and couldn't find anything to eat and died. So this is one of the big, big things. Other big problems are development of wind farms around uh, coastal wetlands, pollution, of course, uh, reduction of uh, sediment flows because of upstream damming of rivers, um, over exploitation and disturbance. And of course, the big threat to all low lying areas in the world today is sea level rise. There's a lot of uh, a lot of problems. However, it's not all doom and gloom. Like the, um, now that the, the coastal wetlands are so threatened, they are of course also a pri priority for the conservation community. And there are many people around the world, many organizations around the world that do their best to, uh, to protect these uh, valuable sites. Uh, the BirdLife Partnership for one, we are the partnership of 116 organizations, national organizations working together to develop a joint strategy. One of the programs that they're jointly implementing is the Flyways program that I am leading. And for the Flyways program, coastal wetlands is one of the highest priorities. So we organize ourselves along Flyways, which is essentially we share the same birds making it possible. So in all these countries you see in blue, BirdLife Partners are working on coastal wetlands. And jointly, we, um, we, we, we raise our voice at higher level, like for instance, conventional migratory species. So the pictures below show that the essence of the BirdLife Partnership is wherever these migratory birds go, they will find a, a friendly place that help them 
uh, spend a good time in their country. Um, I am allowed to post a little bit about bird life, so here I go. Um, have you heard about the recent ADB Regional Flyway Initiative? It has been in the news a lot. If you haven't heard it, there's a YouTube, uh, a bird life uh, webinar was done on it. It's on our YouTube channel, but in a nutshell, it says it's an initiative by the Asia Development Bank. It's a 20 year plus investment program that totals up to 3 billion US dollars. And it aims at the conservation of 5,200 coastal wetlands in the East Asian Oscillation Flyway. And the beauty of it is that biodiversity conservation sits at its heart. So it's the sites are selected on the basis of their value for biodiversity conservation, especially migratory birds. And alongside, it's taking into account the co-benefits these sites can give for uh, economic development and climate change measures. Um, so that's a really a, an impressive new development. It's the first time that any regional development bank has worked on this, put biodiversity so at the center of its work. And at this scale, a whole flyway uh, for this kind of money and for this time, kind of period. So this is really impressive. And uh, this is going to make uh, changes at flyway population level, for instance, for the critically endangered small bird sandpipe. And, and this is the boasting moment, this has been inspired, guided, co-developed by none other, BirdLife International. We have been working with ADB and the East Asian Australian Flyway Partnership to make this happen, and we will stick to it and make sure it will deliver. Moreover, we're making every effort to have the other regional development banks follow suit. Okay, I could say much more about the amazing work that BirdLife is doing, but much better that I hand over to people who are actually in the field doing it. So today we have three talks. The first is from Roof Mulders. Uh, he's from the BirdLife partner in the Netherlands with the unpronounceable name Vogelbescherming Nederland. And he will talk about the successful restoration of the Haring Creek, the coastal wetlands in the, in the Middle East. Uh, second, we'll have a talk by James Cassie uh, and his sidekick, uh, Pete Davidson, about the Fraser Delta in Canada, the great work they're doing there. And then thirdly, we have Anna Agreda Agra Agra sorry, from uh, Avesi Conservation, uh, from the Park in Ecuador telling all about the Jambelli Strait and other coastal wetlands that uh, she is protecting in, uh, in Ecuador. After that, as Sarah had explained, there will be ample time for questions and answers by the panelists. So please, please put forward your questions and, uh, and we'll try to answer the majority. Then I have another, before I end, I want to show you this slide. Throughout the world, BirdLife partners are making every effort to protect coastal wetlands and the migratory birds, migratory birds that depend on that. But this requires investment. We can only do so much uh, without your help. So I kindly ask you to consider making a, uh, a donation, however generous you can be, for the currently running uh, fundraising we're doing for coastal wetlands. So Sarah, if you can please put in the chat the link to the, um, to the donation. Just listen to the webinar today, hear about the amazing work that both our partners are doing and look into your heart at it's Thanksgiving day after all, uh, if you can make uh, a donation. Thank you so much. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, stop sharing. So the next presentation is by Ruf Molder. Uh, Ruf Molder is a marine ecologist with the BirdLife Partner in the Netherlands. He is a very keen, possibly obsessive bird watcher. I'm proud to say I've seen one bird that he hasn't seen, but that's about as good as it can get. I won't mention the name because I know he will then get slightly depressed and I want him in full speed to talk about the Haring fleet in the Netherlands. Over to you, Ruf. Thank you, Barend, for your introduction. I will put my presentation on. I hope it works like this. 
Um, yes, my name is Roef Mulder. Uh, I work for Vogelbescherming Nederland. And I would like to tell you something about uh, the Haring Fleet. And the project is about the restoration of a coastal wetland in the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands, it's, it's located in the, in the heart of the East Atlantic Flyway. On the, on the picture of the left, you can see the, the global flyway, the East Atlantic Flyway with the, the blue spot in the middle of Europe is, uh, is the Netherlands. It's a very important uh, site for migratory birds, uh, estimated about 90 million birds migrate each year from the north to the south and use uh, well, mainly the Wadden Sea, but also the, the southwestern part of Holland, uh, which is called the Delta. And on the, on the map on the right, on the, the picture on the right, you can see the outlines or you can see the big red areas just above the middle. It's, it, those are the, the, the important areas in the Netherlands when you can see the Wadden Sea along the coast to Denmark. And the, the five red lines in the, they are the, the southwestern delta. That's the area I'm going to talk about today. And these coastal wetlands are important for many species of migratory birds. It's, uh, it's not only migratory, but also breeding. We have a lot of breeding birds here also. Uh, of course, there are many species of waders, uh, but also ducks, geese, grebes, many species of uh, uh, gulls and terns. And well, you can see the whole list. It's a very important area for, for uh, the European uh, bird populations. And this is another view of the position of the Netherlands in the, in the European system. It's, uh, maybe some of you can recognize on the bottom, it's, uh, it's the Netherlands, but it's turned uh, the other way around. Here you can see that the Netherlands is the, actually the, the opening of a river system of Europe. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the upper side, you can see the Alps. And the Netherlands is, is the delta of the big European rivers, the Rhine and the Meuse. So they connect the ocean with the, the inland to the Alps. And it's, it's a lot of fish migrate also there. So it's actually the crossing of the flyway and the swimway. And this is one of the, the factors which result in a very high biodiversity in our Dutch delta. But the delta is also a very fragile. Um, like Barend already mentioned, we are a very low country. So half of our country is below sea level. And uh, historic storms and disasters have uh, shaped our current coastline. We built dikes and dams to protect us from this water. But these are also a, a big barrier for tidal dynamics and, of, of course, also for the fish. And as a result, most of the estuaries have been lost, except for the Wadden Sea, which is a very highly protected area now nowadays. But on the, on, the, on the right, you can see a picture of the Southwestern Delta with the various dikes and dams. And the Haring Fleet is the project I'm gonna to talk to you about. It's a Northern part. And it was closed by a dam in the, behind the big flooding in the, in the 1950s. Uh, and on the left, you can see a picture of it. It's, a, it's part of the Delta Werke. And this dam is, to, to, is built to close uh, when the, there are storms and high seas, so it, it can be closed, but it's also uh, uh, resulted in a large freshwater body. So there used to be a, a gradient from salt to freshwater in these areas, but now it's a, a barrier also for the water. So we've lost the gradient, we've lost the estuary. Well, the project is to open it again, to restore uh, the, the, the habitats, but also uh, public awareness, communication, and to facilitate visitors there because we, the nature is really nice to see and we want to show it also to the people. This is an overview of the area. It's, uh, this is the Haring Fleet. On the left, you can see the, the dam, which, is, is, was closed, uh, which closed the area off. All the green areas are uh, parts of the project where nature was restored or new nature was uh, was developed. So it's it's a big project with uh, more than ten locations. And this is an example of the the habitat restoration. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, what used to be agricultural field. It was bought from the farmer, and it was turned into uh, tidal habitat. And this is uh, at the beginning, uh, in the back, you can see it also and on the right, you can see the result after a year. It's, it's growing with vegetation and it's, uh, well, it looks very good. And it also results in many birds arriving there. Uh, and these birds 
not only for feeding they use these area but also for breeding birds we want to to uh, to create possibilities and uh, several breeding islands were built uh, breeding is a, a problem in these areas because we have a lot, lot of ground predators like cats but also foxes so it's uh, very nice to to cr uh, create safe breeding islands where these birds can breed without being uh, without access from ground predators also some very nice hides were built you can see that uh, on the left it's called the tai which is really it's a fantastic hide i've been there several times it's uh, it's really big you cannot see this on this picture and it, the the view is also really nice it's, you can see it on, the, on the, this picture uh it's the there's a, a big colony of sandwich turns just breeding in front of the hide and it's really uh, fantastic in the in spring when they arrive and they well it's a very uh, nice spectacle and on the on the left picture you can see actually you can see the dam on the background which was closing off the system uh, it's not only about birds this project uh, there's also an iconic fish to tell the story uh, this is a sturgeon which uh, was extinct already for for many years but now they're trying to uh, reintroduce it uh, and it's an iconic species if you know it it can uh, grow up to two three four meters it's really and of course the, the eggs are a, a special uh, uh, caviar uh, this is one of the reasons that it, the, the, the project has a lot of success because it's a very interesting it's an iconic species which is uh, well very nice this is the, the final result of the project. Uh, just in one picture on the back, you can see uh, the dam again. This is all new habitats. In total, it was 230 hect hectares of new nature was developed. About 100 hectares were restored, which uh, and also the, the sluices on the Haring Fleet Dam, that they now operate uh, fish friendly. So they, they can also open it for fish and for uh, a little bit of salt water. So we get more tidal influence. Um, there were several breeding islands and bird hides were built. And it was not only, of course, vogelbescherming, but this project is a great success because there were many partners involved. And it was uh, national government, local governments, uh, all uh, organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, nature protection organizations, a World Nature Fund. Uh, this is one of the factors that it was a success. And it was, and it was also a big uh, funding action. It was by the Postcode Loterij. You can see it on the right. Uh, 13 million euros was invested by this. So it's... Uh, this was a very nice uh, result for this uh, this project, and it was also it got a lot of attention in the media. Here you can see some examples of it. It's uh, I think it's an example of how to restore this tidal habitat. It's a really nice story, but of course that's my opinion because I worked on it. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, and well, if there are questions, you can ask me later on. Uh, thank you, Ruf. That's indeed an impressive uh, result. And the great thing about coastal wetlands is if you allow them to recover, they can do so actually quite uh, quickly. So of course, there are also complex ecosystems, but the, the initial response is really quick. Uh, and that is sort of a great boost for people to continue working on them. So even the Netherlands with our famous Dutch waterworks that were clearly too rigid for nature to also benefit, uh, you can see how it can be again. Yeah. Turn backwards, I have to call it restoration. Um, so now moving on to the presentation of James about the Fraser Delta. So James is uh, the Fraser Estuary Specialist with Birds Canada. Birds Canada is one of the two Canadian bird life partners. James has an academic background in international environmental policy. And before he joined Birds Canada, he works on eelgrass, marine planning, hydropower, and the concept of environmental flows. Oh, that's a good one. Anyway, on the basis of this experience, he is now working on the Fraser Estuary. Um, in case uh, in the in the in the Q and A, there will be also joining James around Fraser Delta is Pete Davidson. He is the senior conservation advisor for Birds Canada. He's a lifelong birder and bring uh, Pete uh, the global perspective to the Birds Canada local to hemispheric conservation program. Um, Pete uh, is, is working for Birds Canada. Uh, however, he's based, he's from the UK, 
and he now lives in East Africa, uh, I think with a, with an in-between stop in Asia. So he's truly a, a, a human migratory traveler. Anyway, so now James will talk later on. Maybe we get to hear from Pete. Uh, take it away, James. Excellent. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, Pete and I, as Bernard mentioned, work with Birch Canada, which is a, a national conservation organization in Canada focused on uh, driving action to understand, appreciate, and conserve birds across the country. And we partner with Nature Canada in delivering BirdLife International's important bird and biodiversity area program. And I'm pleased to talk today about one of the, the premier sites on the west coast of the Americas, uh, the Fraser River Delta. For those joining us from a bit further afield, the Fraser River Delta is located on the west coast of the Americas, right just north of where the Canada-US border is located. It's out at the mouth of the Fraser River, which drains roughly 1,300 kilometers running from the Rocky Mountain to the sea and located right next to one of our Western, one of Canada's largest metropolitan areas, the Greater Vancouver area. It's also a hub of international trade. Pre-colonialization, the Delta supported a, a vast network of streams, coastal wetlands and prairie grasses, as well as millions of salmon, oolican, and other fishes, such as sturgeon, which we heard of earlier, as well as millions of migratory birds. The richness of the Delta also supported one of the largest aggregations or concentrations of indigenous communities on the coast. Unfortunately, since colonization and associated genocidal practices, we have suffered significant losses in our indigenous communities, both a loss of life and a loss of culture. However, the ecosystems of the Delta have also suffered significant losses under these practices with an estimated 80% of coastal wetlands having been lost since colonialization. But as with the Coast Salish people who have demonstrated significant resilience uh, and continue to work, play and live on this, their traditional unceded ancestral territory, the natural systems of the Delta have demonstrated remarkable resilience and continue to be present on the Delta in ways that inspire awe. There are roughly 1.7 million birds that use the Delta annually, um, spread across estuarine waters, intertidal mud flats, and uh, the coastal floodplains, which today are mostly agricultural fields. At least 13 different species representing dabbling ducks, swans, geese, shorebirds, gulls, grebes, cormorants, and a number of others are present in numbers that exceed national or global criteria of being significant aggregations worthy of conservation priority. And also, the Delta is the largest overwintering aggregation in Western Canada of raptor species. In of themselves, these individual species aggregations are remarkable and make the place a magical place to visit and go birding, especially during the winter, as a lot of these are overwintering aggregations. But today we're gonna to focus mostly on shorebirds. The agricultural lands and the intertidal mudflats support roughly 1.6 million shorebirds annually. The Dunland pictured here on the left, uh, overwinter in flocks of up to 80,000 birds, and the, Dun or the Western Sandpipers, pictured here on the, the right, uh, over, use the del del Delta mudflats in populations of over 300,000 as a stopover site during their migration. This, the picture here is of Robert Banks, which is the primary mudflats used during this stopover. As a result of this remarkable abundance, the Delta is also designated as a Western Hemisphere shorebird site of his, his hemispheric importance. The, the network is that designed to identify and help conserve sites that are of unique importance uh, across the Americas. Despite long knowing the importance of the site, it's only recently that researchers have come to understand what draws shorebird to this particular mudflat in such large numbers. Starting right now is a, a clip showing Western sandpipers uh, float, feeding on the mudflats. It's been slowed down significantly to allow you to see that the probing or the 
uh, slurping motion, which we'll talk about in a sec, as both of these are not visible at normal speed. For a long time, it was assumed that shorebirds are feeding on invertebrates on the mudflats, and to a certain extent, that's true. But uh, first captured by a, a micron microscopic image in 1995, a close-up of the tongue revealed that the Western sandpiper's tongue uh, has special adaptations that make it look like it's a piece of Velcro. These, these bikey features shown in the image on the lower left uh, allow the Western sandpiper to slurp up, slurp up a thin muddy substance called biofilm off of the mud. This behavior can be seen in the, the sandpiper in the lower left of the clip which is mostly using short, quick jabs to slurp up biofilm as opposed to a deeper probing activity. Further research has dis discovered that this estuarine biofilm is made up of diatoms that under certain conditions produce large amounts of polyunsaturated long chain fatty acids, or what we'll say as fatty acids for short, that alter the physiology of the migrating shorebirds allowing up to 15% more power during the migration. Just as you or I might add omega fatty acids to our morning smoothie to improve our health, these birds are feeding on biofilm to help prepare them for the next leg of their migration. Zooming back out to a bird's eye view, one of the core questions now being explored is what triggers that fatty acid production in biofilm? Researchers believe it's some combination of salinity, temperature, and microelevation on the flats. The leading hypothesis is that the change in salinity associated with the change in the flows from the river, environmental flows, uh, changes the triggers the production of diet uh, sorry, triggers the production of fatty acid by diatoms um, and thereby increases the value to the birds. With this information in hand, we, the bird conservation community, now have an impact pathway to consider that links changes of flow in water to, in our coastal wetlands to alterations in fatty acids of production and biofilm, product, potentially reducing the quality of the forage available to long distance migrants. On the Fraser Delta itself, there are three factors having serious impacts on the flow. Climate change is changing both sea levels and the amount of freshwater runoff that we're experiencing. Urbanization is altering where we allow water onto the delta and shipping infrastructure is altering the flow of water across the intertidal flats. Currently, the most immediate threat to shorebirds on the Fraser Delta is a proposed container terminal at Roberts Banks. If approved, the Roberts Banks Terminal 2 project represented by the orange box will alter the flow of water across the Robert Bank mudflat and thereby alter the fatty acids found in the biofilm. Because of this, experts within the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Canada have warned their government, our government, the government of Canada, that should the Robert Bank Terminal Project proceed, there will be unmitigatable species level risk to the Western Sandpiper. But I wanna, as a member of the bird life community, you now know about the scale of the threat to the facing Western Sandpipers, Dunlin and other shorebirds on the Delta. What can you do with this knowledge? At very least, we hope you can send a letter to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Canada expressing concern. For those that need a little support, we put a link in the chat with a pre-formatted letter that'll let you send an email with a couple of clicks. But I want to be clear, turning the tide on the loss of our coastal wetlands will require sustained effort across multiple scales. From the microscopic to the flyway scale, we will need support from one another time and time again. Addressing how climate change, urbanization, port infrastructure, and other threats alter flows and thereby our coastal wetlands across the flyway and the Pacific Rim is something that the Pacific BirdLife team is well suited to take on. For this reason, I'm excited to see where the discussion goes with the BirdLife team and its effort to create a coastal water life, coast, a world coastal form. Uh, together, we are the voice for birds and let's make sure we're heard. With that, thank you so much for, for listening and learning a little bit about biofilm, the Fraser Delta. And um, thanks to the, the researchers that have been doing the work over the years and the contribution of others in terms of photos and video.
Thank you so much, James. It's uh, it's truly impressive. It's a beautiful site. It's great to see the Birds Canada together with uh, with other partners are working uh, to to save it. And uh, and of course, the discovery of the biofilm was a major uh, discovery. So yeah. Please, everyone, do consider uh, using the link in the chat to send the uh, the email to help push the uh, the campaign um, to keep the, uh, this important coastal wetland safe. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll try to answer the majority of them in the, at the end of the next presentation, which is by Anna Agreda, and Anna Agreda is a wildlife biologist from, born in Guayaquil, which I now know is the biggest city in Ecuador, has 25 years experience in ornithology, bird watching and conservation. She has led explorations throughout Ecuador, low-lying coastal areas up to the Andes, up to the Amazon. And um, since 2007, she works on shorebird conservation for the NGO Aves y Conservación, which is the birdlife partner of, uh, in Ecuador. And she runs the conservation program focused on critical shorebird sites, including the Equasol Salt Lakes and the Jambelli Strait. And that's what her talk will focus on. Um, as I mentioned in my own talk, we will, uh, we will be we're raising funds at the moment, so if you are considering giving it, pay special attention to this talk because a part of the funds that will be raised will go to support the work of Anna. Uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Yeah, my talk today will be on salt lakes and mangrove forests to critical ecosystems for migratory shorebirds in Ecuador. Firstly, I will talk about Equosol Salt Lakes. These two uh, main created salt pond complexes located in the most extreme salient of coastal Ecuador, named Puntilla of Santa Elena. Uh, uh, one of it is Mar Bravo complex with uh, 350 hectares of extent. The other one is much larger, is named Pacoa and is 950 hectares. They are 40 kilometers apart and are owned by Equosol Company. Ecosite has received two international designations, firstly as IBA KBA by BirdLife International in 2005, for being home of congregatory aquatic bird populations, and for being wintering area for 37 aquatic migratory birds. And Ecosite has also uh, been designated as a western site of regional importance because it receives over 20,000 shovels per year. However, our data from the last decade shows that numbers can be much higher in certain years and even uh, can uh, reach almost 100,000 shorebirds annually. Most importantly, it harbors between three to 7% of the biogeographic population of the Wilson Spallerup. And Equasal, was a, Equasal is a critical stopover site during active migration uh, for the Wilson Spallerup. Between North America and its wintering grounds at Andean uh, Saline Lakes at 4,000 meters. High salinity favors the blooming of brine shrimp and brine flies, among other uh, insects that are uh, the most important food source to boreal shorebirds. Bar brine shrimp is also used to produce biomass as a source of food to commercial shrimp by a company named BioArtemia that resides also within Equasol. Despite of its private condition, there are some critical threats to Equasol salt lakes. The most important is a non-sustainable habitat use in the buffer zone because of expansion of urbanization and illegal settlements. This pressure is also related to high levels of anthropogenic disturbance and presence of invasive species like unleashed dogs. It has been proven in our studies that cars, motorbikes, fishermen, cyclists, and dogs are agents of disturbance that affect small shorebird feeding and, and resting behaviors. Another critical threat is aquatic and solid waste contamination. This comes mainly from the aquaculture industry. Large amounts of plastics and, uh, are very badly handled and are a problem along the perimeter of Equasol. 
Eh, aves de conservación, eh, BirdLife in Ecuador, manages the conservation of migratory shorebirds at Ecosol since 2007. And in 2012, we published Ecosol's conservation plan and touristic carrying capacity and implemented uh, this instrument between 2012 and 2016. Since then, we have created these three programs of work that we implement until our current days with support of different donors, NDCA, for example, but also with the support of the Ministry of Environment of Ecuador, local municipalities, and Ecosal company. We have a control and surveillance plan and educational and environmental communication program, and we have a long-term research and monitoring program. We have successfully empowered Ecosal company to protect uh, uh, their limits. They have trained personnel, maintained surveillance protocols, and have a private security uh, service that controls the presence of trespassers. And we have uh, uh, located a strategically a Western signage and are working with the company on a sensitization campaign to mitigate the problem of invasive species in Salinas. PACOA, the salt production uh, complex that is located in the north, is our next big challenge because it was always uh, considered relatively distant from the human uh, population and it maintains an important native vegetation cover in the buffer zone. However, since 2018, urbanized areas have expanded and currently a big portion of the land has been sold to comuneros. We need to prevent a situation similar to the one that we are experiencing in Salinas. So we are trying now to move fast and are looking, looking for support to find the legal ways to create a communal protected area co-managed between San Pablo Comuna, Equasal Company and our NGO. The square in green that you can see there in the, in the picture belongs to the Ministry of Economical Inclusion. The area in yellow that you see there in the picture, in the Google map, map picture, is, has been sold already to several uh, different owners or comuneros. And the area in, in light blue is proposed also to be a conservation area that has not yet been uh, used. So we are proposing to find a way uh, to protect uh, all this uh, land in the buffer zone of Ecosol and it approximately uh, the size is of um, over 200 hectares. Now I would like to talk about another important site in Ecuador that is the uh, Hambali Straits, Canal of Hambali. Um, and firstly, I want to say that one of the most important estuarine deltas in Ecuador is the Guayas River Basin. That discharges more than 20 million uh, uh, cubic meters of fresh, wa fresh water into intertidal sedimentary ecosystems. This river gives a rise to the Gulf of Guayaquil, which harbors Ecuador's most extensive mangrove forest remnants. The Hambali Channel is located in the southern part of the Gulf between Puna Island and the coastal profile. It uh, has an extent of 80 kilometers. Hambali is home of 19 species of shorebirds. 16 of them are Nearctic migrants that depend on the intertidal ecosystem like mudflats and mangrove forest. Uh, Hambali has, was recently designated as a Western site of international importance because it receives more than 100,000 shorebirds annually, harboring 10% of the biogeographic population of semi palmated sandpipers and Wilson's plovers and, all, and uh, the almost 9% of the biogeographic population of Wimbros um, as other important species. It encompasses an area of 55,000 hectares of mangrove forest and intertidal mudflats. 35% uh, of this area is currently protected within the National Ecological Reserve of Manglares Churute and 9,100 hectares have been concessioned to the sustainable management of traditional users that lived upon mollusks, crustacean, and crustacean recollection. Another 10,000 hectares in the southern part of this area um, has not yet been protected. The most critical threat to mangrove ecosystem is expansion of shrimp farms. Shrimp aquaculture started in 1972 during the 1980s. We experienced the, we experienced the largest mangrove cover deforestation during that time and based on satellite images studies, Ecuador has lost over 26% of mangrove forests between uh, 1996 and 2006. 
In 2019, the Ecuadorian government developed a legal framework to secure the conservation of mangrove forest remnants, and it declared mangroves as untouchable and granted concessions to harvest uh, sustainable fish, mollusks, and crustaceans for the subsistence purposes of ancestral and traditional communities. Aves y Conservación uh, in Ecuador has been working in Humble since 2015. During this time, we have created alliances with key stakeholders. We have provided technical support to concessionaries to implement management plans, built up capacities on mangrove ecosystem services, created an ongoing monitoring program of aquatic birds run by concessionaries, and promote ecotourism designated for a designed and planned, for example, an ecotourist ecotouristic route named Humbly. And currently, Aves y Conservación BirdLife in Ecuador, we seek to improve good governance mechanisms at a local level by implemented, implementing integ integrated management plans endorsed by the Ecuadorian Organic Code as key instruments for regulating and managing economical activities along the coast. We will provide technical assistance to develop integrated coastal management plans in the Canal of Humbley, promote the creation of a municipal ordinance to ensure implementation of this instrument at local level, and will negotiate with key stakeholders, shrimp farm, farm owners, crop collectors, and local governments to implement priority actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. That's a wonderful presentation. And I'm happy I, I, I convinced you to do it in English because it was actually perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so everyone you already have, I've already seen a lot of good questions coming in into the Q&A. So now you heard of Anna, if you have any questions to her or to any of the other speakers, this is your time. Uh, please put them in the Q&A. I will now start sort of reading them out, but as they come in, we can, um, we can take them on. Um, I will start with Ruf. Um, you are first. Um, so there's a question from Joe Deere. Uh, Ruf, stakeholder engagement. How did the project bring the local stakeholders together to understand, feed into, and support the project? Any major issues raised by local stakeholders that work against the project? Uh, can you answer that one, Ruf? Yes, yes, I'm happy to answer that one. Um... I think it's actually two questions and it's about positive and negative uh, effects or influence. One of the very positive effects of this project is uh, the cooperation of the Dutch Angling Association and the benefits this project will bring for the, the fish populations. And uh, uh, this this is our uh, largest NGO in the Netherlands, actually. I think they have about 10% about of our population in the Netherlands is a member of the Dutch Angling Association. So this is one, one very important factor also uh, politically. So that was one, one very good uh, a partner uh, in this project. And uh, one of the more critical uh, stakeholders is the, the, the government in the, 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 the water management because this, this, um, the freshwater reserve uh, should not be at risk. And if, if the, the sluices are open to let in some salt water, this is monitored very, uh, monitored very critically. So uh, they, are, they call it lerend uh, implementeren, which is meaning something like we're doing a little bit by little bit and learning from it. And then we look how, 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 how uh, open we can put the sluices. I don't know if I say it correctly. But salt water is, uh, 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 well, they don't like salt water. And that's, that's because we use this fresh water for agricultural use and the farmers, they really don't like salt water. So this is monitored very, very critically. Yeah. Okay, but how, how did you actually bring them together? So how did you manage to, to cross and negotiate? Did you? Well, this, this is actually, there was a big investment was made because there was a, a freshwater inlet just situated just behind the sluices and it was uh, moved 30 kilometers uh, upstream. So that gave a lot of uh, extra room for uh, letting in and experimenting with this salt water and this gradient to, to, to restore the estuarine conditions in this water. So that was, it, it costs a lot of money, but it gives also a lot of possibilities. Excellent, thank you. I hope that answers your questions, Joe. 
Um, so there's a question from Fiona, and uh, that's an intriguing question. And she asks, are waders more susceptible to habitat laws than other birds? And um, well, I guess I could try to answer that one, but I ask any of the others uh, to add in if they feel I leave something out. But the problem of waders, and I, I guess that's with all specialized uh, organisms, is that they only can go if they're elsewhere, if there is an elsewhere. So the problem with coastal wetlands, the birds that use coastal wetlands are tend to be quite specialized feeders. Of course, they are ones that are less specialized, but generally they're quite specialized and they travel long distances. So this narrow strip along coast and especially along the mouths of rivers, estuaries, um, those areas are the only places they can go to. It's not like they can go somewhere else. They need this specific uh, uh, sediment to feed on. And in addition, you get the added risk of the connectivity. So sites can only be so far away from each other and they need to arrive on the time. So, you know, it is, I wouldn't say they're more successful, susceptible to have the laws than other birds, but they are, really are, uh, it's critical for them. They can, uh, they have these sites and they only have so much uh, room to maneuver. Um, and linked to that, there was another question, which was about how many times during migration do these birds stop to refuel? Is that every day? And that is an anomalous attendee. And I'm, I'll still answer the question. Um, it depends a lot on the species. So I think the most impressive non stop flight was made, at least as far as we know, was by a satellite tag. Uh, Bartel got with that flew in one stretch from Alaska to New Zealand. It spent 11 uh, or even 12 uh, days in the air, uh, crossing around 11,000 uh, kilometers. So it was a single stretch. Uh, so that's really impressive. On the other hand, you have birds that have a, a much shorter hopping behavior, but still they can spend considerable time in the air before they refuel. Actually, the birds also adapt um, their body to the long distance migrants. So for instance, birds will feed like crazy, fatten up, and then at that moment they have enough fat, they put all their energy in the development of their wing muscles, the flight muscles, and reduce the size of their gizzard because they don't need it. So actually when the birds, even after a long journey and probably very hungry, arrive somewhere, they will need a little time for that sort of internal organisms to readapt again to feeding conditions. I hope that answers the question. Um, now looking at a few of the other questions. So John Sylvester has a good one for James and I guess Pete. Uh, do other calidrids have the same tongue adaptation as Western Sandpiper, a recent UK record, uh, appeared to stand out from the accompanying birds it flocked with. So I, uh, it's a record of probably a sighting of a birds uh, in the UK. And um, so um, can you answer that one, James? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll talk the, the, the number of questions along the same vein. So I'll just tackle the, the story. Um, more broadly, the yes, there are other small sand shorebirds that have sort of the same adaptation of the tongue that enable them to, to engage in this kind of feeding behavior. Uh, we we know on the delta that Dunlin are also um, using this strategy to a certain extent. Uh, semi palmated, I think, have also been found. Uh, to, to use this foraging strategy. So there, there are a number, there's actually 21 different species that have been identified in a paper. I'll put in a link here in a second um, that people can track down and, and look if they want to find out some more details about the various species. Um, the, there's, there is a question about um, how widespread this activity is and biofilm itself is found across multiple aquatic environments. It's fairly pervasive. The, the question it really is, is that biofilm producing fatty acids? Uh, so these long, these polyunsaturated long chain fatty acids are the, the key nutrient. And that only gets produced in certain circumstances when they're, when these biofilm are getting stressed. So uh, the, the, the key sites appear to be those on 
wetlands that are subject to uh, some sort of freshwater input. Um, so I'll, I think that answers kind of a series of questions there for you. Okay, thank you, uh, James. Um, so here's the question, I guess, Anna, you can take a lead on that one. Um, so there's Brian Klopfel, sorry if I mispronounced, but how do fish farms affect the quality of wetlands habitats and should we not eat farmed fish? I guess you can apply that to, uh, to the shrimp farms as well. Um, could you try to answer that one, Anna? I think you're still muted. Yes, what was the question, excuse me? So the question is, do fish farms, or in your case, the shrimp farms, affect the quality of the wetlands habitats? Yeah, I guess in another way than just destructing them. But yes. is there runoff? Is, are they using chemicals, whatever? Yes. Uh, it, it, would you advise me not to eat farmed uh, products from those farms, or is there an alternative? No, there is no alternative. We have to go on with living, and that means also production. And the idea here is to try to, to, to balance these things, yes, to know, to work together at some point. Uh, it's not an issue of a stop uh, eating. Um, this is a huge world with many people, billions of humans. And uh, Ecuador, for example, lives upon shrimp farms. Um, I would say that the third income, economical income for Ecuador is, is, is shrimp farming. Is, are, so, and there are many people depending on this, uh, on this economic activity. And uh, the idea here would be to try to work with them. There was another question that I read also, I don't know if I could uh, insert or respond that question at the same time. The, the, the idea is that uh, to understand that uh, 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 shrimp ponds can be also alternative uh, foraging habitats for shortbirds. And we have been uh, trying to approach several of these companies, um, mostly of the small ones, but also several big ones. And start, uh, luckily, um, a good portion of them have allowed us to, to, to work with them, to, to approach them and, and have opened their shrimp farms for us. So we, we were studying how shorebirds were using the, the shrimp farms and indeed they are, they are very important, especially during high tide. We did a three month study and especially during high tides and during the process of what is called the, um, um, I, don't, I cannot, when they are collecting the shrimps, when they uh, deplete the, 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 the spawns, this is like a, um, a, a harvest they have, during the harvesting time. This is a critical point for shorebirds. And for three days, uh, we studied that they were using them uh, enormously. So uh, our idea is to basically tend to find ways to put at uh, the same table uh, the government and, and the shrimp owners, shrimp farm owners, as well as other uh, local important key stake. Um, stakeholders, like for example, the red crab collectors. That's what we will try to do uh, by trying to implement or, to, or during the process of, of creating these uh, integrated uh, coastal management plans. And, and, and we believe that uh, this is very possible to do. We have currently uh, signed already um, um, inter-institutional agreements between uh, us and other stakeholders, uh, so we think that uh, they may be totally open to, to sit and, and try to find out ways to reduce contamination and also help us understanding more about how shorebirds are using uh, these uh, artificial and productive um, uh, ecosystems. Thank you. Yeah, but the advice would not be to not eat the shrimps. You say we just need to turn them around. So is there like a certification program that you, like you have Marine Stewardship Council or FSC yeah. or Wood, or is there something that you could advise people that at least take into account the sustainability of uh, shrimp farm products or farm? Yes, certification would work. Um, 
I believe that Wizern is currently has has currently uh, published um, a good practices management plan that uh, probably will help also to to be implemented in other areas, like for example in South America. Although in Ecuador is very different the situation in comparison to Central America, because they did they this this instrument based on what is happening there. In, in, in South America, especially in Ecuador, it's quite complicated. It's not impossible, but uh, uh, we need to, to do lots of lobbying and, um, and also convince the, 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 produ the, the shrimp farm, farm producers that uh, uh, they, could, they could also apply for another certification. Every time I approach them, I always tell them that I work for, uh, for the largest uh, salt production company and that we have uh, during throughout these years produce so many things that are environmental, more environmental, environmentally friendly so that they, uh, they actually were like um, uh, interested in, 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 in allowing me to be there. So uh, this, is, this is the mechanism. Um, I mean, we are not, uh, uh, we, we have to, to tackle this problem and uh, certification is one way we need to find one specifically that could work for, for let's say, short but friendly or something like that, because they have many certifications already. Because we are talking about an industry that is huge in Ecuador, it's a monster, it's a 400,000 millions of dollars that income that come into our country. So, so this is a very important industry. So we have to, we have to create this certification eventually to, and we need to to do more work directly with uh, with the uh, with the ones that uh, represent the shrimp culture, shrimp farm production industry, the ones that represent them. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, I have a question which I'm sort of going to jump to Pete because he hasn't spoken yet, uh, and there's a question about Mozambique. So I thought maybe you could, you know, that's your current part of the world. So the question is. How would I begin the process of protecting an important coastal wetland area to become a part of the flyway at White Sands Barra in Hambana, Mozambique? And that's a question by Gary Rowan. Okay, well, good question, Gary. Um, and one of the first things that comes to mind is another Gary, Gary Opal, who lived in uh, Mozambique for some period of time, till very recently. Um, he works for BirdLife and he would have some really good ideas and he'd be really interested to help you answer that question. Um, but before you're able to reach out to Gary and we'll send you his email address, um, I'm sure we can manage to do that before the end. Um, find out who, um, who owns the, the area or who, who has management jurisdiction over the area and perhaps go uh, and have a conversation with them, see if they are aware of uh, the natural values of the, of the site um, and share with them what you've learned about the place. Uh, I would also probably try to contact um, whomever the, the local bird life partner in Mozambique might be or uh, a similar um, NGO that might be interested in uh, the issue uh, and then you might try to get in touch with one or two other I'd say maybe BirdLife Africa office which is based out of Nairobi in Kenya um, because they will coordinate uh, project work between different African nations um, South Africa has got a really strong program as well so the will be able to help you too uh, on the bird life side, but as Baron will say, as global flyways program coordinator um, and joins all of the dots all across the planet, uh, that yeah, I mean he's the he's probably at the very top of the chain. But he might have one or two ideas about how you coordinate things. But I, I would suggest trying to trying to find um, a local champion for your site um, and doing that by finding out uh, who owns and manages it first. Yeah, really good, really good pointers uh, to Gary. Um, so yes, uh, Gary, um, P, 
please do contact me. I can put you in contact with all the people that Pete mentioned. I think you're in your question, you already indicate that um, there's one crucial element that you're already doing because you, you're talking about 12 species that have recently been recorded in large numbers. So I think one of the foundations for any successful uh, conservation initiative is knowing the facts. So knowing how many birds are there, what are the main threats, what's the area of the size. So that's a kind of basis information. And anyone you will reach out to will start asking those questions. So why is that site so important? So if you by yourself or maybe with some friends or close allies could record the bird numbers that you're seeing in a, in a, in a systematic way that they are sort of objective and standardized way, uh, that's sort of your your powerful uh, message. That's the one, the story you can build on. It doesn't have to be perfect from the start, but um, that's a good starting point. I'm happy to put you in contact with the flyway coordinator in Africa, Alex Ngari, who can give you many more pointers and may have further suggestions of people you could reach out to within Mozambique. Um, not sure how I can share my, I can, I'll send you, I'll drop you a line with my email address. Okay, but then moving on to another question. So has any of the panelists seen a question in the list they would really jump in to answer? Anyone? If not, I will just pick there's one. one about the Ram, well, there's one about Ramsar, which I thought was quite interesting and relevant to the Canadian situation. Yes, so there's a question by Russell Leavitt. In Europe, the best wetland sites are designated by national gov uh, governments as Ramsar site, does this happen in Canada and Ecuador? And that's a question to, well, both of you. So Pete, James, Anna, who wants to take this one first? And then we'll move to another one. I'll start and then um, why don't you go, Anna and James, maybe round, round out. Uh, yes, is the answer. Um, certainly in Canada, there are, I think, something like 37 designated Ramsar sites in Canada. And uh, the Fraser Estuary that James told us all about is one of them. It's kind of a flagship, actually. Um, that and one in the Arctic, which is the second largest Ramsar site in the world. Um, but interestingly, uh, when Ramsar sites are designated, uh, it is something of a political process. You would think it's simply a, a straightforward factual process. Um, but the Roberts Bank mudflats that James told us about are not actually within the Ramsar site on the Fraser Delta. A large number of other wetlands are, but because of the uh, contentious future management of the Roberts Bank area, they weren't included in the Ramsar designation. So a very, very pertinent and topical uh, question. Anna, how is it in Ecuador? Mm. Well, yes, the question is like in Europe, the best Westland sites are designated by national governments as Ramsar sites. Uh, well, in Ecuador, I would say that Ramsar sites, which are currently 19 sites and cover a huge area, are mostly within the protected system and national system. So I think the government is trying to to identify and also um, move protection one step forward, you know, doing a uh, giving more plus to the protected areas and, and there are many other wetlands that are not yet uh, considered uh, for Ramsar. Um, Equasol especially didn't like the idea to be part of Ramsar because they are a private company. And they kind of uh, vinculated Ramsar as a political thing and they didn't, they just preferred to have these international designations as IBA and and also Western sites and 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 and, and they, they they like it a lot. But Ramsar is very political to them and, and they decided not to apply. Although they are currently thinking on the possibility of getting of turning into a, a more like a private protected area. Uh, it, this means a, a, a lot of paperwork and, and eventually we'll go for it, but we are still not sure of that. And this is because of all the problems that we have in the surroundings, right? So uh, in the case of the, um, of the Canal of Hamburg, 
um, the site is so new that uh, I don't think the government has thought about the idea to 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 apply it as a Ramsar site. But um, Manglas Chirute is a Ramsar site, I believe, and so part of the of this KBA of this very new KBA of this new Western site is a Ramsar site already was already and uh, the whole site is part of a much uh, bigger area that is called a UNESCO Biosphere um, Reserve. So this is of the Cajas. So it is a huge area that includes these uh, lowlands, these estuaries and also the, the intertidal mangrove forest. So um, I believe the, the, the area is kind of well protected in some in some way. Yeah, of course, in in, uh, in different countries in different regions, different sort of structures are in place that provide the best protection. So the highest ranking like the triple A plus plus designation for conservation, of course, is a, a, a World Heritage Site. That's definitely the one that gets the biggest impact because, you know, it's such a a loss of face uh, uh, if uh, if if a, a world heritage site is sort of designated and then the government can't support to maintain its quality. Like uh, we seen uh, only a few months ago, all the hassle around uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. You know, everybody kicks into gear to just avoid that 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 world heritage status is removed from a site. But then through in different regions of different things. The, the important thing I think to, to look out is to take the one that provides the most um, impact on the ground. So in, in, the, in the question that says it's Ramsar for Europe, but actually in the, in, the, in the EU, I think things that has been designated as a Natura 2000 site might be a stronger one because the follow up and the, the, the consequences behind it the mechanisms behind it are, are easier to navigate, um, but it's still very difficult. But yeah, so each region you will you will approach something different. Is there anyone who wants to add to this one? If not, we move to another question. We have still have a I'll, few. I'll just jump in quickly on the Fraser Delta specifically and the Ramsar designation, because your point there, Bernard, about the strength of a designation is important for us. And we, we have found in Canada that due to the jurisdictional complexities of estuaries, uh, the Ramsar site hasn't been a particularly strong designation. And so the, the estuary itself is highly at risk, approximately 102 different species of conservation concern that risk of being locally extirpated. And so uh, that that concept of wise use within the Delta, or sorry, within Ramsar and, and, and wetlands uh, doesn't seem to be applied to the Delta. And so we're, we're concerned about a change in ecological condition of the, the Ramsar site. And uh, we'll be following up on that one for sure. Excellent. Okay, um, so there's still a few questions out there. If people still have questions, keep them coming. I'm um, not sure we can answer them right away, but we'll try. Um, and the, um, there's a question, and this is a sort of, uh, sort of uh, a, a, the ultimate crossover. We have Chitte, who is from the Netherlands, but he's actually now in Ecuador. And he's asking a question to Roof about the Netherlands. And his question is, with the success of Haringfleet, does the opening of part of Flevoland, is that still an option? So because of the big grazers, I guess, in the Osvaldos Plaza, is not really a success. Roof, do you want to touch that one? Yes, yes. I'll try to explain the situation because it's. I think it's also a typical Dutch situation. Uh, one of uh, uh, a big threat for the wetlands in, in the Netherlands is the succession of the vegetation. I don't know if that's the correct English name, but it's the, like like flowers, they get into bushes and bushes get into forests. And in the end, everything is a forest. And in, in, in the Netherlands, we have a, a lot of agricultural uh, activity. So we have a, a lot of uh, nutrients getting in the atmosphere and getting everywhere. So plants are growing very fast. 
And in Flevoland, it's called the Oostvaarders Plas. It's a nature reserve. It used to be a, a wetland, but it's turned into forest. It was turning into forest. And then the, the manager of the, the area, they decided to put a lot of uh, cattle and, and deer in the area. But that has its own problems because, they, well, they walk around everywhere and they disturb also birds. So uh, water can be a solution to manage to maintain a wetland and it's not like the water a wetland of course it's water but the dynamics of water so if you can fluctuate with the water levels if you get higher water levels in the winter you can well you can just kill the vegetation and it won't be turned into forest in a couple of years so I, yes i think it could be an option for this area although it's not uh, the tidal dynamics and eh? that's twice a day and here it's an inland area so you have to be well it, it will be seasonal dynamics maybe or you have to maybe divide the whole area in four pieces and then put every piece two years in underwater and then oh, make it a dynamic water. Uh, how do you call it? Dynamic flooding of the area. So yes, I think it could be an answer, but no, it's not a tidal dynamics there. So, but interesting question, interesting solution. Yes. Okay. So we're, we're approaching out the, the, the last uh, session. So we have a few minutes and, and there are two questions, um, one from Junit and one from Fausia. And I think I can combine them, but actually the question is all about what can we do in other regions? And the question is, um, what are sort of the take home messages? So here in the panel, James, Anna, Pete, Ruf, possibly myself, um, we have a few specialists who are working on wetlands conservation. So I'm going to ask each one of the, 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 the presenters um, to draw one, what they feel is the most crucial lesson from their project in coastal wetlands conservation. And then the other, the task for the next one is to add on to that. So saying if James says one thing, it's not like Anna can repeat the same thing because then <laughs> want to have like five true lessons from the reality of coastal wetlands conservation. Um, of course, I make it the easiest for the person who goes first. So <laughs> are there any takers for the first putting that one out? If not, I will just go by the reverse order of the presentations. So Anna, <laughs> what would be your single message you're really the thing you learned but you thought was most valuable for the conservation of coastal wetlands what would that advice be to help junit and faults yeah yeah um well i would say um firstly uh, work hard on the on understanding the people uh, understanding their conflicts uh, what is going on there uh, what are they interested on in the wetland? So, um, and how can they gain benefits from it? That's 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 very important uh, to work with the people. That's an excellent one. So, over to James. What can you add on to that take-home message? Yeah. Okay. So, um, building off of the the building relationships element of it. I think relationships, the permeability of relationships are key. And I think uh, the, allowing water to move and maintain a relationship with the land is a key strategy. So avoid hard infrastructure and allow infrastructure that allows that permeability and relationship between different parts of the ecosystem and the communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pete. Do you have something? Going back to the beginning, um, especially for, for anyone who is at the start of a process, having really strong information and facts, uh, so bird counts, but more than that, if you have people doing scientific research, uh, put together as much solid research that link um, the different elements, uh, as James was just talking about, of how an estuary functions. You might be using your birds as your indicator. Um, and I think the East Asia Australasia Flyway Partnership is a great example of this. They've done a lot of really serious flyway research um, over decadal period. And they are finally starting to reap some rewards in, um, I think a blanket ban on coastal wetland reclamation in China. 
um, a major new world heritage site in South Korea, um, and also the highest number of threatened shorebirds, waders of any flyway, but uh, they're managing to turn it around and science has been key to that. That's an excellent addition. So roof, what would be your adding on take home message? Uh, well, it's difficult to find to, to add one, but I would like to stress the, the, the idea to work together and to find stakeholders with the same interest. So you, and then also try to find the economic benefits of, of, of wetland conservation and maybe the tourism, ecotourism, but also angling. And, and, and one uh, additional factor which is coming more, becoming more and more important is the, the carbon sink you already mentioned in your introduction that tidal areas can, can absorb a huge amount of, of carbon dioxide. And, and that's, of course, it's one of the, our main challenges for the coming decades. And if more people are aware of that, maybe you can have more stakeholders and people who are willing to cooperate in preserving and, and restoring these wetlands, these tidal wetlands. So that would be my message. Okay, great. So we already have four one. So in all modesty, I'm gonna add one. I don't see myself as a, a specialist on the coastal wetland. That's one dimension. So of course, it is a bit in my ballpark, but um, it, it's the flyway. So actually there's a lot of power with the people with whom you share your birds. So for instance, if the government of Iceland comes to think of the plan to reforest large part of the places that the, the waders breed, because they see opportunities now that climate is relaxing at their end. That is a devastating effect for all along the East Atlantic Flyway. And what happened is that all bird life partners in the East Atlantic Flyway send individually letters to the government of Iceland. So sort of making use of that connections, the birds that you actually physically share with people in other countries are also your allies to explain your government in the same way that James is now asking us to send a letter to help him with putting, building political pressure, is that sort of connection along the flyway. But it's not only along the level of like uh, putting pressure on, but it could be helping out. It could be, um, you know, knowledge sharing. It could be people joining you for counts. It could be people helping you with materials, et cetera, et cetera. So, Think when you look at your coastal wetlands, wherever you are, think about what are the logical places along the flyway that we share birds with and try to build relationship with the people that are out there. Possibly they have good ideas, possibly they need your help more than you need theirs, but you're all in the same game. So that was sort of my last one. Sarah. Hi. I just wanted to say thank you very much, everybody, for um, presenting today. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all the attendees and say that was a really interesting uh, webinar. We've had some brilliant feedback from it. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. If you were inspired today by um, the plight of coastal wetlands from migratory birds, of course, you can donate. Uh, we would very much love to have your support for our current appeal. Um, which is going to support coastal wetlands around the world, including the um, uh, Hanbeli Strait that uh, Anna spoke about today. Um, you can do it using the link that's on the screen now, or I'll also pop it into the chat box, um, and you may even get redirected at the end of the webinar um, to take you to the page. So if you want to support the work that you've heard about today, please do support our appeals. We can't do any of this work without the donations that we get. Uh, we are all charities um, and we would love to um, see your name pop up on there. Um, but I think that's it from us today. So from myself, thank you very much. I'll throw it back to you, Baron. Yes. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. I think uh, bear in mind that if you have any friends or colleagues that you want to alert to this webinar, there will be a recording on the BirdLife YouTube channel. Uh, of this webinar and um, so it can be shared. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, it was an honor to be the host of this meeting. I especially thank all the presenters, Ruth, Anna, James, Pete, for their participation. And of course, Sarah for helping out behind the scenes or was I helping her out? Oh, well. Anyway, thank you all. Uh,
keep us in mind. Have a great day.